It's pretty obvious that Disney is currently in its live-action era, and I can totally see why they do it. This trend started with Alice in Wonderland in 2010, and that movie made over a billion dollars. So of course they're going to continue this, and while they're at it, maybe they can make even more profits by remaking Disney princess movies. But so far, a lot of the live-action princess movies have been pretty underwhelming. They just have a strange mix of corporate blandness, as well as the gaudy energy of a Las Vegas show. But I'll give an exception to The Little Mermaid, because I thought it was pretty good, but the aesthetics were not it. Disney! This is a Little Mermaid movie! Like, up the saturation a little bit! But Halle Bailey did not hold back with her vocals. She low-key carried this entire movie. With planned live-action remakes of Lilo and Stitch, Hercules, and Moana, I don't see this trend stopping anytime soon. Personally, I feel indifferent to this, but I thought about two movies in particular that opened the doors for this trend, Cinderella and Beauty and the Beast. These were very important moments for pop culture because they were based on legendary animated movies. Cinderella is a massive icon for the Disney brand, and is one of the most controversial and overtly examined characters from any media. And Belle is sort of a fan favorite because she's like, smart and stuff. When Cinderella came out in 2015, I knew about it, but I felt like there wasn't a lot of hype and discussions about this movie. But I do recall seeing gifs of it all over Tumblr, so that's one thing. On the other hand, in 2017, it felt like everyone in my class went to see Beauty and the Beast in theaters. It had tons of media attention, and compared to Cinderella, it had the financial upper hand. But why? I myself saw this in theaters, and when it was over, I just thought, Oh! Okay! And yet, it seems like Cinderella is the more favorable live-action Disney movie. For the record, I will be saying the original Cinderella and the original Beauty and the Beast a lot in this video, but when I say that, I'm referring to the original Disney movies. Yes, I'm aware that there were initial productions in 1912 or whatever, but I'm not talking about that today. I will start by talking about Beauty and the Beast because I would rather have this video end on a more positive note. And keep in mind that this is based on my opinion, so if you agree or disagree, you can share with that in the comments. But when the topic at hand is Disney princess movies, it's going to be a good time. So let's get started. Beauty and the Beast came out at the height of the Disney renaissance. It was the first animated movie to be nominated for an Oscar and is generally considered to be the best Disney movie ever made. My personal favorite would be Hercules, but whatever. At the time, Disney just put out live-action Cinderella, so a new Beauty and the Beast movie makes sense for the next adaptational step. My spellcheck said that's not a word, but I just decided that it is, so there! For some reason, in the production stage, making this movie as a musical was a pretty big deal, which was weird because the original movie was already a musical. Even the scene of the townspeople low-key dragging Belle was a musical number. I'm pretty sure the fans were expecting to see people sing. It's not that deep. But anyways, we're back into the provincial French town where everyone talks in British accents. Belle is a local outcast in a community of redeemable bigots. But them being trifling isn't their fault because they're all under the Enchantress's spell. This is so unnecessary, for real. The thing is is that some people just have bad attitudes. They choose to be close-minded, and the animated movie got that right. Even Disney's certified dumb jock stereotype is still written to be at least a little bit sympathetic. Like, why? What did he do? Much like the animated movie, Belle's introductory scene is met with a song. An awkward, highly studio-corrected song. It has been talked about a lot, but the auto-tuning situation here was a choice. It's hard for me to enjoy these songs when the vocals just sound like studio processing. I would say that the logical step is to just have a professional singer do all of Belle's songs. But one that somewhat matches Emma Watson's voice. I can't handle another Hilary Duff situation. But the issues don't stop there. In a story where the thesis is finding true love, the two main leads lack any sort of romantic chemistry. Throughout this movie, the Beast does that rom-com thing where he's just sort of mean to Belle, and we're expected to take that as charming. Well, it's not. And when there's a scene where they dance together, probably the most famous scene of Beauty and the Beast, it doesn't feel earned in this movie, where in the original, you could see a development of their relationship. But for most of this runtime, we see Belle repeatedly running away, and the Beast constantly rolling his eyes at her. 
And then they end up together because this is a Beauty and the Beast movie, and that has to happen. Yeah, I don't see it. This is a very petty issue I have, but why is the side of her dress like halfway up? I don't get it, it's distracting. And speaking of dresses, I don't know what was going on with her grandiose ball dress. In fan and circles, it's generally decided that this movie is set in the Rococo era. And on top of that, there's a multitude of references that can be made to the original dress. So the possibilities of the design should be endless. And yet, this is a $200 million movie, and the best that Disney could do is make some spirit Halloween couture. I'd say what really brings this dress down is the bottom half. The differing ruffles just look weird. And considering that their last princess dress looked like this, it really makes you think that this is the movie with the higher budget. I get that this isn't the biggest deal, but this dress along with the rest of the movie just isn't serving a fantasy like how I imagined it would. The general vibe of this movie feels so low energy, which is a weird direction for a movie like this. Maybe the writers wanted this movie to be more mature than the first, so it's a little less whimsical, but all we're left with is safe, somewhat sparkly genericness. An overall fault of this movie is that it's pretty boring and kind of gaudy. Simple as that. It seemed like in the 2000s, Cinderella was enjoying a pop culture renaissance. Of course, with the start of the Disney Princess brand, she was everywhere, always front and center on the lineup. There was that critically messy direct-to-DVD sequel, which was actually the first Cinderella movie I've ever seen. There was even a Cinderella moment for the teen market. Brandy was Cinderella, and that was iconic. Hilary Duff was Cinderella, and that was also iconic. So was Selena Gomez, that wasn't so iconic. What the hell is a Zoon? Britney had a song called Cinderella on her third album, which is Y2K pop at its finest. And then a girl group called I5 did a song called Cinderella, which was famously covered by the Cheetah Girls. Disney literally shaded itself. This was a moment. Who else remembers when 3 did a cover of Cinderella? I'm still obsessed with it. But enough about comfort movies and pop songs that get in my essence. Cinderella is a huge staple in the Disney canon, so they had to get this right. The production for this movie started right when Alice in Wonderland came out. Allegedly, it was planned to have a darker tone similar to what Alice had, but with a change of directors, this idea was scrapped. The final result showed Cinderella's story being pretty different from the original. This time, Cinderella's father passes away when she was older. So technically, the time of her whole mistreatment is a lot shorter. Cinderella also has a bit more freedom than what she had in the original movie. She's seen walking in town, she has a human friend, and even rides a horse. Look at her go! But you could say that this contradicts her character arc of being trapped and over-controlled. And that the scene of her attending the ball just isn't as impactful. I get this criticism, and I do agree that the original movie handled this better, but honestly, I don't mind this. Keep in mind that this is an adaptation, not a shot-by-shot -shot remake of the animated movie, so there will be some changes to the story. One change is that this movie is slightly more upbeat than the original. The scenes of her being out in public at least offers more visual elements than just being inside a dark house. With these characters in varying settings, we see hues mostly consisting of greens, blues, and some interior yellows. And the nighttime scenes are shot in a way that looks even more whimsical. All the other live-action Disney movies need to take lighting notes from this movie. This is how you translate real-life settings from animation. And we get a scene of her and the prince meeting each other before the ball, so at least they're a little bit acquainted instead of immediately falling in love. They get their own rom-com meet-cute scene. I'm loving that for them. I also appreciate this movie for giving us a pretty good villain. Kate Blanchett did her thing in the role of a stepmom. Her performance kind of reminds me of Mommy Dearest, and her looks alone deserve its own video. Even the stepsisters' outfits are so beautifully tacky. We can tell what type of characters they are just from their costuming. Their color scheme was considered trashy for the time period, but they're low-key delivering confidence, so I give them that. I think what made this movie work so well was that the creators took time with it. It had a relatively long pre-production stage, and every moment of this was meticulously crafted. We see frequent motifs of butterflies, lots of color symbolism, and detailed set design. And I will admit that one thing that gives this movie a million points from me is the dress. You know the one I'm talking about. The main goal that the designers wanted was to create a real-life watercolor painting. And yeah, they really did that. 
I would say what really makes this look pop is the crystals adorned all over her dress and her hair. And it has butterfly adornments on it! I'm freaking out! The ballroom scene is probably the signature moment in Cinderella, and this version really lived up to that. It's an homage, but simultaneously offers something new by looking more modern and extravagant. There was real effort put into this, and it's wild that this had half the budget of most live-action Disney movies. I think that a lot of the new remakes feel so lackluster is because they are hastily put together productions. If Disney were a bit more patient and took time to make something like Beauty and the Beast or Mulan, we could have seen something that ended up a lot better. But they're not going to do that. They're going to put out as many projects as they can because these movies are pretty low effort to make and nostalgia is an easy marketing tool. But at least we can appreciate Cinderella for what it is. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's a pretty good fairy tale movie, so I'm vibing with that. But yeah, this is a random thought in my head that I wanted to say out loud. I had a lot of fun talking about this, and I hope to see you all in the next one. Bye!